Hello, Church History friends. My name is Barb Walden, and tonight I have the joy of welcoming you to our seventh evening lecture in the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation's Summer Lecture Series. We greatly appreciate you joining us this evening to listen to Wendy Eaton share stories about the Joseph Smith Historic Site in Nauvoo, Illinois. In addition to tonight's exciting lecture, I also want to remind you that we are hosting a bonus lecture this Saturday. Andrew Bolton is returning to the lecture series to share in an online program called 75 Years Later, Ending War, Forging Peace, the legacy of US President Truman and the peace mission of Community of Christ. Andrew's lecture will take place on the historic anniversary, anniversary of President Truman signing the ratification of the UN Charter by the US, making the United States the first country in the world to do so. On that same historic day, the second atom bomb fell on Nagasaki, Japan, and ended World War II. Andrew will discuss these events and their significance to us today as Community of Christ pursues peace throughout the world. Before we jump into tonight's lecture, I want to introduce you to our co-hosts, two fabulous people who have hung in there from the very start of the summer lecture series. Oh, the tales I'm afraid they could share. Our first co-host this evening is Peter Smith. Peter is a member of the Board of Directors for the Historic Sites Foundation and has served as an incredible co-host for our annual Historic Sites bus tours since 2013. He's practically the face of the foundation at this point, maybe even the mascot. I also want to spotlight Megan Reed, another remarkable person who will serve as a co-host tonight. Megan is working on her master's degree at Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. This summer, she's serving as a student intern for the Kirtland Temple and is assisting behind the scenes throughout the lecture series. In fact, Megan is here tonight thanks to your generous donations given for the Alma Blair Internship Program, a restricted fund managed by the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation. Thank you for helping support the young adults at the historic sites. It was announced this week that the Community of Christ Historic Sites will be closed until the end of the year. It was a difficult decision, but one made for the safety of our visitors, volunteers, and staff due to COVID-19. Despite the site closure, the stories from church history and the preservation and maintenance of the historic sites continues on even in the midst of a pandemic. Donations received from tonight's lecture will help support the Community of Christ Historic Sites. Megan has dropped an online donations link in the chat box for anyone preferring to make an online donation. Donations can also be sent through the mail to the address Megan has provided as well. Thank you for helping support the ongoing preservation and maintenance of our shared church heritage this evening. Now for the main event, our evening lecture. Our guest speaker tonight is Wendy Eaton. Wendy serves as the Administrative Assistant for Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation and the Joseph Smith Historic Site. She is the author of this spring's Tuesday Tales and has assisted in the research of a number of educational resources offered by the Historic Sites Foundation. Wendy is a former student intern, having served multiple summers at both the Kirtland Temple and the Joseph Smith Historic Site before joining the Historic Sites team full-time in 2016. What Wendy won't tell you is that she is often a go-to person for random church history facts and stories. I relied on her many times when facing a church history roadblock or dead end. She's like the AAA service for church history emergencies. However, tonight will be emergency free as we sit back and enjoy Wendy's lecture entitled Stories Behind the Preservation of the Joseph Smith Historic Site in Nauvoo, Illinois. Welcome, Wendy, and thank you for joining us this evening. I'll turn the mic over to you as we are all ready to hear about Old Nauvoo. Thank you, Barb. I'm going to get my screen up to share, hopefully. There, is it up? Okay, great. 
So the Joseph Smith Historic Site, which is mostly over on the right of the photograph before you, covers approximately 40 acres and 19 buildings and about a half dozen marked locations of where buildings once stood. The homes of Emma and Joseph are not just trapped in the few years that we talk about on tour with the end of Joseph Smith's life, though. These are the homes that Emma chose to stay in to raise her children, and they, in turn, stayed and raised their children, at least at first. So it was really exciting for me when I came across the memories of one of her granddaughters, Vida. Vida helped set the tone of my lecture tonight. She is the second child of Alexander and was born in the mansion house in 1865. She spent her early years in that home with her grandmother before Emma moved across the street to a home you'll see in just a little bit. So being childhood memories of a woman in her 40s, we must keep that in mind. They might not be 100% accurate to facts but fully how Vida felt about her grandmother as it's almost completely centered on Emma that Vida thinks of her childhood in Nauvoo. Vida also inherits the artistic Smith genes, so you need to keep that in mind as I share her words as well. We will be moving between Vida's memories of home and my notes that I've collected over the past few years. So this is a picture of Vida and her husband, Heman, when they're visiting Nauvoo in 1905, and this is Emma Smith's grave. Vida writes of the cemetery, you do not dream that over south of the trees, there are purple fleur-de-lis in royal splendor. You do not fancy the sweetness of clumps of bluebells and shaded wood violets but I have seen them there where the haven trees throw up a tiny grove of saplings near to, yes, over some of the graves of loved ones. In this sad, sweet place, a rest was found for hearts weary with the battle. One brave heart burning with youth and life and love grew cold in one short hour and slept in this little neglected unmarked spot. Years after, a brown-eyed son, some little grandchildren, a beautiful daughter-in-law, and at last, a world-weary wife lay down near him. Much of the driving force to doing something with these historic properties is centered around the cemetery. When Vida's just a toddler, her grandmother wrote to her son and said, Joseph, I should like, if you are willing, to extend that fence so as to enclose the graves of your two little brothers. I've got $25 that no one has any right to but myself. I feel anxious to apply that money on the graveyard. Lack of funding would be part of the reason Joseph and Alexander would not be able to do much during their lives, but Alexander keeps the idea in the minds of the presiding bishopric. The story of Emma's fight to hold on to her properties and the later decades of the properties being sold to the church is long and complicated. In a nutshell, Joseph Smith Jr. as trustee and trust for his church was responsible for paying the credit on approximately 4,000 acres of land and a riverboat. He dies leaving property ownership in turmoil and creditors wanting to be paid. There are 12 years worth of legal matters to undo the mess. And finally, the core of the historic site, the homestead, the cemetery, mansion house, Nauvoo house, and Redbrook store are fully owned by Emma. In addition to the core block of the site, Emma holds on to the family farm, which is just a couple miles east of here. The property is divided among her family and they hold on to it for a couple generations before it's being sold to the church. That last step concludes around 1916. Adjacent properties would join with the core of the site throughout the 1900s. The first couple decades consist of cleaning up the grounds and some initial maintenance to the homes. 
this image that you see is taken sometime between 1918, when the site officially opened as a historic site, and 1928. The cleanup has started here, but there's still some work to do. Off to the left is a tree that you can almost make out Emma's grave. Joseph and Hiram are still unmarked. In January 1928, W.O. Hands led a team to find the graves of Joseph and Hiram. There was concern that the graves might be lost due to the rising Mississippi River levels. After just a couple weeks of cold work, the graves were found. Emma's grave marker was dismantled. She was moved next to the brothers and her stone was cut in three and re-inscribed. And you could see that initial stone of Emma's cut in three over on the left, where it says Emma, wife of Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith the prophet, and Hiram Smith the patriarch. There were numerous ideas of how to mark these graves in the future, but not much happens till 1951, which is when the marker you see on the left was, replaced, was laid. The 1950s marker reads in part, in memory of Joseph Smith, who translated the Book of Mormon, and on April 6, 1830, organized the Church of Jesus Christ. And then along the bottom, erected and maintained by the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, 1951. Here you see some modern images of the cemetery where Emma, Joseph, and Hiram are now marked by a large stone that was laid by the Smith Family Foundation, who provide ongoing maintenance and research on the cemetery. Part of that is finding and identifying as many graves of Smith family members as they can to lay new stones. So you see Emma's second husband, Louis Vitamin, and then Joseph Smith Sr. and Lucy Max Smith identified fairly recently. If the date of 1870 is correct, this is what Emma's first Nauvoo home looked like when she moved into her last home across the street. Vita's thoughts on 1905 on the homestead focused primarily on the outside, especially the Mississippi River and the graves of her family. Though she gives us a peek at how much work needs to be done when reflecting on how her father, Alexander, saw the homes of his early childhood. Vida remarks, the great river flows on. It is unchanged, but it alone. The trees have died and new ones have grown. The shrubs are gone and weeds and wild bushes throng the place. But the heart of the wide world has swallowed them up. They are throbbing sometimes in the homesick deeps of the dear old river swell. They are weary or happy or lying at rest while the little lad who waited for his mother in the long gone years stands today in the neglected homestead. And while his eyes note decay and neglect in the old scene, rejoices that beyond it all, his mother waited for him. So you see the difference in how much they cleaned over the years around the homestead with this about 1920s era image. The residents of Nauvoo are pretty interested in the work going on along the riverfront. A Nauvoo newspaper, The Independent, reports in June of 1918, the south and east fronts of the old homestead will be left as they originally were, showing their hewn logs. There's debate as to how to use the site early on as they're developing. One thought was one of the maintenance individuals, P.R. Burton, and his family might stay in this house. They end up living in the Nauvoo house, and the homestead is used almost entirely for tours. But there are a few other uses that, are, that it gets served as. There, besides just being a tourist stop, the church takes advantage of using the space as a place to distribute church publications. And I'll talk a little more in just a bit. A 1928 youth camp sets up their camp bank in the homestead. 
they also use it for some reunions or for classroom space, much as reunions would later on. We've been slowly updating our artifact catalog, and I came across a card that mentioned a violin. I didn't think too much more of it. I was busy on other things, but I went looking in the visitor center attic for something else, and there on the top shelf was this violin. There's a maker label tucked inside, and on the label you can read, made by Frank Carroll, Nauvoo, Illinois, year 1927, of wood taken from the residence of Joseph Smith, the prophet at Nauvoo. With just a little additional searching, I found a February 2nd, 1927 St. Harold article about this violin. The article reads, Mr. Frank Carroll, violin maker of Nauvoo, presented J.W. Layton with a violin made from a piece of black walnut taken from the old homestead. This violin is beautifully made and has a splendid tone. It will be added to the other interesting relics kept at the mansion house. Frank was a long-term resident of Nauvoo. He was the son of German immigrants and a carpenter by trade. He's, I believe, a member of the Lutheran Church here in town, but like other residents, he's interested in what's going on down here. When needed maintenance removes part of the wood from the homestead, that piece of wood is given to Frank, and he is in turn able to create this incredible artifact to help us continue to tell the story of the Smiths and their lives here in Nauvoo. A little bit on maintenance. Between 1954 and 1956, there is a lot of work done on the homestead. It's wired for electricity, the buildings lifted for a new foundation, exterior walls are repaired or replaced, plasters removed, fireplaces repaired, a new floor is laid. You get the idea. A lot of work is being done to make this place better to serve the growing tourist need. My next quote of Vitas is a little long, but this image of the mansion house is incredible. It shows the hotel wing still attached. Vida remembers the home of her birth as this. There was laughter and merriment in the big house for the young delighted to gather there. One by one, the boys crossed the old stone steps each with a wife, until three daughters-in-law called Emma Smith's mother. The first grandchild came into the family in the homestead. A remarkable little lady she was, with big brown eyes and quaint, dainty ways. Then the first grandson was brought home. Then the family circle became disturbed by a movement of some of its members. The church was reorganized and memory of past persecutions lent fear to the future. Popularity began to wane. In the midst of this, the pall was spread in the mansion again. And while one dark-eyed son girded himself with a long, hard stripe in his father's place, another closed his sunny brown eyes, and his mother wept that they opened no more. To comfort her, the poet's son David sang, you know how he loved the warm sunshine and wished it might shine away. He had gone to the land where the father and son will bask in eternal day. They have filled his grave on the warm hillside, neath the shade of the green locust tree, where the wild birds will sing and the wild flowers spring and the long grasses wave mournfully. It was then that my grandmother gathered up the one little grandson and whispered, I am glad that he is named Frederick. Again, remember Vida is a poet, so we must look at her words through an artistic lens. The granddaughter she mentioned is Emma Josepha, born to Joseph III and Emmeline. The two sons mentioned are Joseph III preparing himself for his father's place and Frederick Granger William Smith, who died in the mansion house in 1862 after a long, terrible illness. 
The grandson named Frederick is a little puzzling. Vida's older brother is named Frederick Alexander. He's born in 1862. And her cousin is named Frederick Madison, who was born in 1874. So I'm not sure which Frederick Vida is referring to. This was very possibly a family story she heard. It's the Frederick Grandma Emma is referring to is her brother. Thanks to the research and reports kept by the late Ken Stobaugh, there is a lot of information on the mansion house. Alexander writes a letter in 1892 and comments that some of the trees that Emma planted are still living. And I believe the pine tree that's in the corner just inside the fence is one of the trees that he was referring to. When Emma and Lewis moved to the Riverside Mansion, Alexander and his wife Elizabeth and their children live in the front part of the house, while David, his wife Clara, and their son live in the back. Not long after the birth of their son, David begins experiencing some decline in mental health. Eventually, the family makes a difficult decision to have David move to an asylum. After David is moved, Clara, who understandably struggles with the health of her husband, eventually moves with her parents with their son, Albert. Alexander is then left with the entirety of the mansion house and hotel, or rather his wife, Elizabeth is left alone as Alexander is beginning to travel pretty regularly for the church in his role. In 1890, Alexander had the hotel wing demolished. Local Nauvoo residents are not happy about this, but it's work that needs to be done so that Alexander can save at least part of this home. He writes a letter to his daughter, Vida, about the removal of the hotel wing. He says, the front view is the best, but a view from the east will show what I have done to the old home. I had to have the big dining room and all east of the room where the big brick oven was torn down, and of course, the thus exposed part weatherboarded up. So it leaves the house as it was ere the addition was built. Number nine, the room you were born in, of course, went with the rest. The house is a good house now. I had it newly roofed and painted red. I love the old place yet and would gladly go back if there were saints enough to form a church there and I had means enough to fix up the old home as I would love to. Alexander would return to this home a number of times, especially when reunions would draw him to the area. It's after a reunion in 1909 that he visits the mansion house once more, he takes ill and dies in this home. Work really picks up though, not too many years after his death. And by 1927, it has become quite a habitable home once again. When President Fred M. Smith visits Nauvoo with his daughter in August of 1927, he wrote to Harold readers, by brother and sister J.W. Layton and daughter Irene, we were given a hearty welcome and given quarters in the mansion house. And Lois and I had the, to us, strange experience of being for the first time domiciled in a home of our ancestors. By the way, one of my favorite tidbits of history that I've come across is it became very popular amongst church members to visit Nauvoo stay in the mansion house or Nauvoo house when they were on their honeymoon. Vida has a lot to say about the last home of her grandmother, the Riverside Mansion, or as she refers to it in her memories, the Nauvoo house. The Nauvoo house speaks to us of graciousness and beauty in plan, but failure in structure. It speaks to me of delightful rest times and gloriously jolly frolics, of dreams wondrously clear to me even yet, dreamed with wide open eyes and a delicious sense of pervading sunshine and shadows and unbroken silence in my retreat in the wide, deep windows of the Southeast Room. It speaks to me of a beautiful personality that I always felt within the deep old room. 
a blanket and pillows in my window with the river, the hills, the pebbly shore, inviting me with fresh washed shells and pink carnelians, bright with sunshine and sweet with song from river and wind-tossed trees. Her grandmother, Emma, lives in this home from around 1871 until the end of her life. After that, Emma's husband, Louis, continues to live here until his death, and then his son becomes the caretaker of the home. After a long process, the church purchases the home from Charlie, and it becomes a residence for some who were involved in the early caretaking of the site, and a place of rest for travelers as it was originally intended including, as I mentioned, youth camp. Beginning in 1928 and continuing almost every year until at least 1955, older youth camps were held here on site, with the girls sleeping on the third floor of the Nauvoo house, meals prepared and served on the ground floor, and some classes being held on the second floor. The plan for the boys, at least in the first year, was to pitch tents north of the homestead, and later you can see cabins were built for them to use. By the way, the cabins were dismantled in the 1950s, so you won't see them today. And this was at the same time, if you might remember, major work is going on in the homestead. One of the parts of that process in the homestead was replacing the floors and the workers were having trouble finding the right kinds of boards it turned out the boards in the cabins were just right for use in the homestead, so they were repurposed at the site. A couple reunion photos for you to see. This is the reunion in 1923, one of my favorite pictures of reunions here on the site with the slide right there in the foreground. This is a baptism that's happening at that reunion. Again, meals are often prepared in the Nauvoo house, though they're not usually served there. And here's another fun image of reunions here on site. The homes were quite the focus of Nauvoo reunions as the main tent you can see is set up just about in the middle. The mansion house is behind the cars on the left. The homestead's in the foreground and the Nauvoo house is partly cut off on the right. Some reunion attendees would day in the Nauvoo house, some maybe even in the mansion house, but most of them would camp on the block that is it's out of the image of this photograph, but it would have just been to the left of this photograph. This photo from the 1920s gives you an idea of how close the Mississippi River is to the Nauvoo house, especially before the protective berm is built up mid-century. You might be able to see off to the left. It's a little hard to make out, but there's a dark structure over there. And I suspect that this was the ice house that stood on site for many years. When it is taken down in the 1950s, many of the building materials are repurposed up at Camp Nauvoo, which is where most camps and reunions for this mission center take place now. The small building you see is the Biteman Stable, built by Lewis Biteman when he and Emma were living in the Riverside Mansion. In 1939, there is a brief discussion of using the Nauvoo House for a visitor center, but by the 1940s, they're looking at this little stone building. Previously, the Mansion House and the Homestead had rooms that served this purpose, but with the ever increase of visitors, they needed more space. By the appointee in 1941 and 1942, Morris Draper saw the beginnings of the vitamin stable being used as a visitor center. Morris writes, we created a small auditorium or guide office inside a building that had been constructed many years before of stone taken from the foundations of the Nauvoo House and used as a small barn. In 1957, the building is expanded in the back and I got a chance to talk to Lee Updike. Lee was one of the many summer students and he served here in 1964. He shared with me some of his memories of that summer and one of these memories was of how the stable was used by visitors. He told me a slide presentation was given to everyone in the vitamin stable before we took them on a tour. 
We thought we were high tech because a rear projection screen had been installed. We told me that the stable was small enough that the student guides typically waited outside between tours if they had time between tours. In the 1970s, Kenneth Stobaugh and others began looking to build a brand new facility to serve as a visitor center. When you exit the back of the modern visitor center, you go down a path and you cross Water Street and typically guides will stop you at the location of where a three-story brick stable once stood in the 1840s. I believe it's this location that is proposed for the new visitor center. And as you could see, the proposed image was a reproduction of a brick barn or stable. Ultimately, not the design chosen or the location, but by 1980, the new visitor center was open for business, giving staff and guests much needed space, a small museum, a bookstore, and office space. The second picture you see is of a simultaneous building project. This is the groundbreaking for the Red Brick Store, October 1978. Featuring in the photo, left to right, Pat Henson, Wallace B. Smith, Ken Stobaugh, Erwin Fender, and George Lund. So here you see an image of the original Red Brick Store and one of it much many years after it was taken down and probably right after it was used as an archaeologic site. Vida would have known the original structure on the left. It's possible she attended church meetings with her grandmother, Emma. The branch initially met in homes, but they soon grew large enough that they needed to use the larger space that was in the upper assembly room of the old store. They called themselves the Olive Branch, and they gathered there for a number of years in the 1860s. The structure is taken down in 1890 and then uncovered in 1972 by the summer archaeological dig. Plans were made to reconstruct the building to help tell the story. And here you see me fresh from a tour and Dennis Pieper Gertis, one of our wonderful volunteers. Dennis is modeling a top hat and he's ready to sell a reproduction Book of Mormon and a root beer to you. Tours end in the upper assembly hall of the Red Brook store, and that space gets used for many other activities as well. Lectures, classes, even magic shows. And during the summer of 2018, we revived the Olive Branch for weekly worship gatherings. And the other photo that you see is of the communion service I was talked to including during that summer season of worship services. The basement of the Red Brick store currently serves as the archaeology lab. We're going to be moving out of the era of Vida's memories of the site, and the rest of my talk will be a fairly quick tour of some of the structures that help support the site. If you were to leave the Red Brick store and walk down Water Street, you would pass three brick buildings and a fenced-in plot of land or a hole in the ground. A man named John Hudson owned this stretch of land for a number of years, and eventually it was sold to the church. You see the far brick image over on, it's almost in the middle of the, the photograph. That's the Wright House. Next to it is the Johnson House. I don't know about the little frame structure in the back, but cut off on the edge of the right is the Times and Seasons. So for the Johnson and Wright houses, these have had a lot of work done to them over the past few years, especially the Wright house. And they are used for travelers, for rent, and occasionally for staff housing. The times and seasons. In the early years of Nauvoo, there were three locations used at different times for this newspaper, one of many operated by the church. This structure is the second of the three. The first two structures are both in this area and they are bought by the church in 1946. The original structure is described by Ebenezer Robinson, one of the early church members, as a cheaply constructed frame building on the corner of Water and Bain. Robinson helped to set up the times and seasons along with Joseph and Hiram's brother, Don Carlos. The 1925 dismantling of this structure 
unearthed a basement that the owner was not aware of. The hole is filled in, but becomes the focus of the 1975 archaeology dig, where they not only determined the location of the building, but they uncovered approximately 600 pieces of pipe set. We'd love to see the building reconstructed someday. The times and seasons played a very important role in the life of the church. Continuing our walk back towards the site, you would pass the home of William and Rosanna Marks. William was the president of the High Council here in Nauvoo, and Emma supported him as a successor to church leadership, but William supported Sidney Rigdon's claim. When Joseph III became president of the reorganization, William served as one of his counselors. I mentioned John and Ida Layton. They were the first caretakers here in Nauvoo, living over in the mansion house. They, of course, have family come and visit them while they are living and serving here in Nauvoo. One of those family members is their niece, Florence. I mentioned John Hudson. He also owns part of this property when Florence visits here as a child. She remembers John being a very friendly individual who enjoyed sharing stories of growing up here at Nauvoo. And John is one of the many who has a story of Mother Vitamin and her always full cookie jar. He also shares with Florence stories of ice skating on the Mississippi River with the Smith boys. When Florence grew, she married a man named Arnold Orth and they lived in the Marks house for many years. After the church purchased the home and land in 1946, it becomes the home of numerous church appointees and volunteers. Cutting across a couple fields, you would come to the first hotel. This is one of the earliest hotels in Nauvoo. It's gone by several different names, such as City Hotel, the Mills Tavern, and the Masonic Hall Hotel. Today, it stands approximately a third of its original side. The building and lot were bought in 1956. When they first arrive in Nauvoo, John and Ida are supposed to live in the mansion house, but it's not quite ready for them. So they stay in this home, the home of Sydney and Phoebe Rigdon. And the Rigdon home joins the site, 1943. And again, it's also used for volunteers and guests. The Hiram and Thankful Clark House, and clearly you could tell I could not find a historic image of this one, but it is built in 1843. Hiram Clark's a prominent missionary spending much of the Nauvoo era in England while his family stays here in Nauvoo. This house, when it joins the site in 1948, became used for housing for staff and guests. There are a number of other lots that I could talk about and show you, but let's move on to one last slide for you. One of the many individuals who devoted a good portion of his life to care and maintenance of the site was named Sidney Moore. And amongst all the work he did, he was an artist. And these are five of his pictures that have stayed in great preservation and we have them on display in the visitor center. We had a regular viewer of these lectures call us and let us know that her father, Barbara Wiley shared with us that her father, Bishop Skinner, worked with Sydney Moore here at the site. I mentioned Florence Orth. Her mother, Mabel Sanford, wrote extensively about life in Nauvoo, including a novel called Joseph's City Beautiful, which won a Herald House writing competition. Talked about Lee Updike. He also shared other memories with me, especially of one of the maintenance workers during the 1960s named John Williams. John especially spent time with the summer students, getting to know them, helping take care of them. And Lee remembers the wonderful rhubarb ice cream that John would make. Lee's father, Wayne, served on site in 1939. Cecil Ettinger was the site appointee in the late 1940s. And then his son, David, served as executive director of Restoration Trail Foundation, now Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation. 
and David is the one who first brought me to the historic sites in 1998 when he decided to lead a youth caravan. There were about a hundred of us crossing the country to visit the historic sites and learn the story of the church. The foundation has the tagline of your story is church history, and that is very true on the site here. Generations of people have their own family history built into the property that Emma held onto for her family. I could bring up all sorts of stories of the different documents I have found in my research for this project, of the many family stories and all the different things that happened here over the past just over 100 years. And Barb and I would love to receive family stories from you if you have family stories about how the sites were cared for and maintained over the years. Not just Nauvoo, but Kirtland Temple, the Plano Stone Church, and Liberty Hall. I'd like to close with the words of an individual who I always heard described as the great Alma Blair. I never had the chance to have him as a teacher so he taught many generations of student interns here at the historic sites. Alma gave a special tour to foundation members in 1995, and I found his tour script. He closes that tour with these words. There is more here in this house than meets the eye, if we will but see it. To see requires time. Time to read, time to reflect, and time to figure out how to pull it all together into a magical moment when interpreter, physical surroundings, and visitor meld with the past. What did they of the past want and desire? What did they feel? What did they succeed in and what fail in? Then if we are really lucky or skillful, we will ask ourselves what we want and desire and will strive for. Then we will have found the history of ourselves as humans under divinity. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, there's something romantic about hearing Vida Smith's words. It was almost like having a tour of Old Nauvoo with Emma's granddaughter. So thank you so much for sharing those words. and. You certainly can't go wrong ending a presentation with the words of Alma Blair. <laughs> that, uh, that captured Nauvoo for us. So thank you so much for sharing your research with us tonight. Also thank you to Peter and Megan for helping co-host tonight and for all of your behind the scenes magic. Lastly, we share our thanks to you, our friends in the audience, for sharing your time with us and for generously supporting the Community of Christ Historic Sites with your donations. We simply could not host educational programs like tonight's lecture without your generous support. Thank you for helping preserve and share church heritage. In addition to this Saturday's lecture with Andrew Bolton, beginning at noon on Saturday, I also encourage you to tune in next week as I share the life and legacy of Marietta Hodges Faulkner Walker. Sadly, next Thursday's program is the last lecture in our summer lecture series. Time sure flies when you're having fun with church history. So until next time, take care, keep reading your church history, and have a blessed night, everyone. <laughs>